Welcome to In, a podcast series dedicated to contemporary visual art practices. In is broadcast by New Local Space, a microgallery and contemporary art initiative in Kingston, Jamaica, and a subsidiary of audio production host Creative Sounds. Today's episode, hosted by writer and independent curator Nicole Smythe Johnson, focuses on art practices of cultural practitioners who in some way address the experiences and identity of Afro-Latinidad. Our guests today are Jamila Aisha Brown, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, Dr. Ariana A. Curtis, Maria Elena Ortiz, Thiago de Paula Sousa, and Luis Vasquez La Roche. Jamila Aisha Brown is an Afro Panamanian womanist. Her work has been featured on NPR Latino USA, The Guardian, Salon, and most recently, she was Bitch Media's Global Feminism Fellow. Brown is a digital strategist and assistant adjunct professor at NYU. Maria Magdalena Campos Pons is an artist whose work is autobiographical. Her work is an investigation of history and memory and their roles in the formation of identity. Born in Matanzas province in Cuba in 1959, Campos Pons bears a familial history that is intermingled with the sugar industry's presence in her hometown of La Vega. Her works have been exhibited in the United States, Canada, Japan, Norway, France, Italy, and Cuba. She was represented in the Johannesburg Biennial and has had a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Campos Pons's powerful attachment to her cultural African heritage is one that she has never experienced directly, but its presence in the rites and myths of her childhood make her a Cuban transplanted in the United States and exiled twice over. Dr. Ariana A. Curtis is the first curator of Latinx studies at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. She is responsible for collection and interpretation related to U.S. Latinx, Afro-Latinx, African American and Latinx, African diaspora and African Americanness in Latin America. Previously, Ariana was curator of Latinx studies at the Anacostia Community Museum. In addition to conducting Latinx-centered public programming at ACM, she curated two bilingual exhibitions, Gateways, Portales, which received honorable mention in the 2017 Smithsonian Excellence in Exhibition Awards, and Bridging the Americas. She also organized Revisiting Our Black Mosaic, a full-day symposium about race and immigration in Washington, D.C. Curtis holds a doctorate in anthropology with a concentration in race, gender, and social justice from American University, an MA in public anthropology from American University, and a BA from Duke University. Maria Elena Ortiz is a writer and curator living in Miami. Currently, she's associate curator at the Perez Art Museum Miami, where she has curated several exhibitions including Beatrice Santiago Munoz, A Universe of Fragile Mirrors, Ulla von Bradenberg, It Has a Golden Sun and an Elderly Grey Moon, At the Crossroads, Critical Film and Video from the Caribbean, Firle Baez, Bloodlines, Carlos Mota, Histories for the Future, among others. In 2015, she also curated Video Islands at the Anthology Film Archive, New York. From 2011 to 2013, Ortiz was the curator of contemporary arts at the Sala de Arte Público Siqueiros in Mexico City, where she organized several projects including Carlos Mota, The Shape of Freedom, and Rita Ponce de Leon, David. In 2012, she curated Wherever You Roam at the Museum of Latin American Art, Long Beach. She has collaborated with international and national institutions such as El Museo del Barrio, New York, DePaul Art Museum, Chicago, Tarble Art Center, Charleston, The New Museum, New York, New Langton Arts, San Francisco, Teoretica San Jose, Costa Rica, The Museum of Craft and Folk Art, San Francisco, and Tate Modern, London. Ortiz has contributed to writing platforms such as Fluent Collaborative, Curating Now, and Terremoto Magazine. In 2014, she was a recipient of the Colección Patricia Phelps de Cisneros, an Independent Curators International Travel Award for Central America and the Caribbean. Thiago de Paula Sousa lives and works in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he worked as an educator at Museo Afro-Brazil between 2014 and 2016. 
In 2016, he curated the exhibition Living On, in other words, on living, at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna, Austria. At the 32nd Biennale de Sao Paulo, De Paula Sousa joined the Acro Study Days team, organized by Gabi Nkobo as part of the public program, and was also part of the Biennale's Oficina de Imaginação Política. He collaborated with the Lanchonete.org, an artist-led cultural platform focused on daily life and progressive actions in contemporary cities with Sao Paulo as a reference point, and co-created We Cannot Build What We Cannot First Imagine, a visionary platform that gathers works and perspectives from racialized artists and thinkers. De Paula Sousa currently researches on the depiction of art from South America and the African diaspora in the German-speaking context. This research will soon extend to non-Western circumstances where he will investigate how the art communities engage in the deconstruction of hegemonic readings of histories. Luis Vasquez La Roche was born in Venezuela and moved to Trinidad and Tobago in 2002. He graduated from the University of the West Indies with a BA in Visual Arts and a minor in Spanish Language. His works have been exhibited in Trinidad, Grenada, Bahamas, Venezuela, Colombia, Scotland, Germany and the Netherlands. He was selected to participate in Beta Local's 2016 itinerant seminar in Puerto Rico. In 2013, along with artists Nicolai Noel and Alicia Milne, he co-founded See You on Sunday, which is an artist collective committed to arts education. He currently lectures at the University of Trinidad and Tobago and is an MFA candidate in painting and printmaking at the Virginia Commonwealth University. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always helpful to start with definitions. How do you define Afro-Latinidad? Do you identify with the term? Are there other terms that are more resonant or relevant to your experience of race and ethnicity? I have in mind here terms like Afro-Latinx, Black mixed diaspora, as well as other national, regional, and cultural affiliation. Jamila, if you would start for us. Sure. I mean, I define being Afro-Latinx or Afro-Latinidad as somebody who is of African descent from Latin America who has had a Black experience. And I think that is a thing that really differentiates it because the region itself is so diverse and so many people when we start to look at their families and their DNA are of African descent, but it really comes down to, have you lived as a black person in Latin America and all of the challenges that come with that and all of the opportunities that come with it as well? Ariana, if you could tell us how you define African descent. Sure, so I think it's similar um, to what Jamila is saying. So for me, Afro-Latinidad um, is a terminology that encompasses Blackness in the Americas as related to, even if not necessarily based in Latin America and the Caribbean. So if we're talking about relation and not necessarily based, and that means it's extending itself to places like the United States, mm -hmm. you know, where I was born and raised. Um, and I know you threw out a few other terminologies in this question, but I think, you know, Black includes Afro-Latinidad, but is not specific to it. Diaspora includes Afro-Latinidad as part of it. Mixed is so vague. You know, and this idea of mestizaje is so prevalent in Latin America, I tend to not really use that term. Um, but I, in particular, relate to Afro-Latinidad in a different way because my mother is African-American and my father is Panamanian. So my Blackness has always not been exclusively African-American and my Latinidad has always been Black. So I think, you know, those are the kinds of things that I bring into that definition. Um, Maria Elena? Um, I, I agree with um, what Jamila and Ariana were saying, specifically to like uh, a black experience. I do think that um, like, I would like to take it, like for example, how do we define Latin America? Like, I think that from the moment that that construct was made, it, for me it's, it's always been very interesting how Brazil is part of Latin America, but Haiti is a part of Latin America, considering that both have actually uh, languages of Latin origin. So, like, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of work and more uh, exploration to be done there. I also feel like um, the experience of blackness or the experience of race in Latin America, it's also very specific to where you are in Latin mm -hmm. America. And I say that because, you know, I grew up in Puerto Rico, I've lived in Mexico, and now I live in the U.S. And, I, you know, my, the way my body is perceived in, in all those contexts is very different. 
Um, but certainly, you know, I agree that it relates to a black experience and also um, what it means to when that black experience is influenced by a Latin heritage, mm -hmm. whatever that that is specifically is. Okay. Maria Magda. Hi. Uh, well, I, I, I kind of agree with all the, the definitions that Ariana, Malien and Yamila have been brought to the table. Uh, but uh, growing up in Cuba and living in America, uh, I think to really uh, the concept of Latin Americanidad or Latinx in a more, more um, complex and more layered kind of definition. Uh, in the Caribbean, uh, they are, that imply not only the blackness, but imply the presence of, of whiteness in the mestizage that come from the presence of European uh, and Latino uh, um, uh, race and, and cultural background. I am thinking too that in, in, in the in area of the Caribbean, such as Cuba and uh, Jamaica, uh, Trinidad, it gets fully complex uh, with the question not only of blackness, but brownness, uh, in which uh, populations such as Chinese uh, include themselves and creating a a, I would say like a three layers or four layers of just a position of cultural heritage, race heritage, ancestral, even the DNA. So is um, I, I, I argue and I struggle myself quite often uh, as, a, as, a, as an artist with all these elements and all these um, uh, different uh, uh, components of cultural together. So um, it's a very, it's a very complex scene, uh, historical, and historically in Cuba to Latin, Amer Latin Americanism was a almost geographical and political term that include two uh, countries of South America with black heritage, uh, such as Colombia, who have an incredible large population of, of Brazil, and uh, so it isn't a, 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 a north in the border. So I, I don't know, should I, should, I, should I come close to any definition? It's a very layered, it's a very um, a murky and in, and in great need of clarification and uh, investigation. Okay. And do you identify with those terms, with Afro-Latinidad or with Afro-Latinx, or is it just a more complex field for you in general? I, I, use, I would say that I would, it, well, I would say, yes, I could identify with it, but even more, even for that, I think that is more complex uh, uh, for all, all these other elements that I mentioned. Of a, um, It wouldn't mean only to be black and Latino or including to be, you know, a mixed race, a Latino, Cuban, or, or uh, Jamaican, or Caribbean, uh, how the Caribbean plays, I believe, and I'm talking with uh, Malia mentioned before, the question of uh, Haiti as a, as a language issue, which is, is a French a language, the Spanish language, uh, create their attention that is to be resolved, but I, I would never make an exclusion of any Caribbean uh, 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 territories as not part of a uh, Latino, la, Afro-Latino um, experience. Okay, I see what you're saying. Well, this would be interesting because Luis, you live in Trinidad, but you were born in Venezuela, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I live in Trinidad and Tobago now. I was born in Venezuela, but to a Trinidadian mother and a Chilean father. Uh, and you know, I, I even li I lived in New York for some time. Now I live in Trinidad. I lived in Venezuela all my childhood. I've been to Chile a few times to meet that side of the family. And uh, uh, each time that I move around, uh, it's a different experience. Um, even for example, in Chile, there's a very uh, small populations of uh, Afro descendants or blacks, and. Um, you know, you get stared at constantly. Not so much now, but before, like in the early 1990s. Uh, so people ask you to touch your hair or, you know, they will look at you and when you look back at them, they just look away. Because, you know, they've never seen, specifically in Chile, because Chile, uh, 
got a, a small um, amount of slaves during the slave trade. Um, so what what is happening now with Chile, for example, is that they're getting a lot of, uh, for example, Haitian immigrants uh, living in Chile, and uh, the, and the, because of that, the xenophobia has uh, is on a rise. For example, we, we, they're also getting a lot of, uh, for example, a lot of Venezuelans who are migrating. So and what Chileans tend to do that anything that it's uh yeah you know they they can they consider themselves white so anything that is slightly darker is considered black i i have this uh always this memory about using the word negro and uh that's what i grew up here and you know you are a negro you are a negro and uh uh but uh, even by hearing that word and hearing the associations with that word, uh, the positive, supposedly positive, and the negative associations with the word, uh, I was only able to gauge more or less uh, how uh, uh, racism in Venezuela, once I stepped out, once I went to New York or when I moved to Trinidad, uh, it's only that I started uh, uh, realizing uh, how Venezuelans deal with race and racism. Yeah. So um, I, Afro Latin, that identity or that kind of um, terminology was something that came into use for you after you left. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, when I moved to New York, uh, I was a kid still. I was, uh, and it was only then that I, I started hearing uh, more often than not uh, things related to my skin color uh so yeah so and also it i think for me in a way uh it it also has to do with uh what is the most predominant culture in your family for example for me growing up uh my dad uh culture was the most predominant culture in within the family so he's chilean he's not black uh you can say that he's from uh native descent from mapuches maybe uh, so, you know, there was never these conversations about blackness in my family until later. So, until, until we moved to New York, actually. Thiago, um, what's your take? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know, I come from Brazil and you might be aware the mess we have in that country when it comes to racial issues, you know, like uh, for a long time, everybody was Brazilian. You know, everybody was Brazilian. Um, and of course, we, we can go back in, into history and we can think that by the end of the slavery period, the slavery time, when all the archives concerning everything that happened during the slavery period were burned, and that new government, that new leaders decided that the country would start a new history, a new moment, uh, forgetting the past. I would say that that contributed a lot to the mess that we live in until now. So, uh, the, the, the nation, the, the country hasn't faced it or has not really dealt with the slavery past so it's still like a scar yes. that we still need to, to to put more energy on to to to, to work a lot on um, and besides this the country is so big but it's an island at the same time i mean when i was in the caribbean like last May, when we met each other, I was having this conversation with a few people that, in a way, for me, Brazil was way more isolated than several islands in the Caribbean, in a way that we are not really in a discussion uh, with our closest neighbors. You know, we are, of course, during, I would say, during 10 years, uh, like I would say that the past 10 years, these discussions went in another level, but 
we I would say that most of the Brazilian people don't even see themselves as Latinos or as Latins. You know, they see themselves as Brazilians. Yes. And this is another wall that we need to break. You know, uh, and so for, for me, it took me a while also to understand what Latin America means or what South America means. We don't even use this word, these expressions in Portuguese. Of, of course, we have them, but uh, this tells a lot about our connections with our neighbors. Like uh, they're really like distant neighbors. Yes, and so. Is the term Afro-Latinidad for you a potential to start doing some of that linking that you're talking about, um, connecting Brazil to its neighbors and maybe broader narratives of blackness? Or do you, do you think that the term Afro-Brazilian, which is also in use right now, um, you know, people talk about Afro-Brazilian art, for example, do you think that that is a more comfortable fit for you? It's again a, an issue with the language. Afro-Brazilian is really a term that we only use in English. We don't use this term in Portuguese. We don't use this in Brazil. Uh, we say black or negro uh, most of the time. And so it's also an issue, like, it's an issue to find certain words or how to create a new grammar to discuss certain issues. For me, when I listen Afro-Latinidad, I, I, I see a lot of potential. I, I, I see a lot of, like, uh, kind of a strong bridge. Yeah, yeah, I certainly do. Okay. You all work in culture, right? As artists, writers, mm -hmm. curators, and we have an entrepreneur with us. Does your experience of blackness and or Latinidad inflect your work or practice? And if so, Oh, and again, I'm going to ask Jamila to um, take it away for us. I mean, it absolutely does. I mean, for me, particularly through my writing in that work, you have to bring your whole self to it. And the way that people connect with you is on a personal level. So there has to be at least a small piece of you in everything that you write. And, you know, it's a womanist, a mujercista, uh, Audre Lorde, when she talks about how the personal is political, is always at the forefront of my mind. So I always want to bring that identity, particularly because a lot of the work that I've done in terms of writing has been in the United States. And to have somebody who looks like me, who is undeniably black, who's very visibly black, has African features, has Afro textured hair, to talk about Latinidad, to talk about the culture that my family comes from, the culture that I was raised in, is very political for me. So I put that to the forefront as an effort to advance and educate the discussion, particularly because of the United States, it's been that when we see folks from Latin America who are black, they tend to be lighter skinned. Mm -hmm. And to really educate people about not only blackness in Latin America, but also just the diversity of the region, uh, is extremely important. And I use Latin American in this context specifically because that's kind of the understanding which is talked about in the United States. And to you know really put that forward and push that forward is extremely important to me personally. And I think that it strengthens my work. And so when you're thinking about Latin America, are you thinking about the Caribbean and Brazil as well? I am, of course. I mean, for me, Haiti is very much so a part of Latin America. And you know, we have to look at the history. We have to see that Simon Bolivar went to Haiti and was inspired by that revolution to go back and to start the wars of independence in South America. We cannot forget that. For me personally, being Panamanian, you know, my family came to Panama through the canal. So my family comes from Jamaica, Barbados, and Guyana. And it's never something that's divorced for me. And just even... You know, I really liked what others were saying about the layers and complexity of blackness in Latin America, because even within one country, so in Panama, for example, you have, for lack of a better term, two different kinds of black people. You have black folks like my family who came through the canal, so they're Afro-Antianos, and then you have Afro-Coloniales who are descendants of the slave. So people, unfortunately, I think when we look at blackness throughout the region, we like to paint it with one brush. 
and we don't understand the differences and nuances of what it means to be black in Cuba versus black in Panama versus black in Mexico. And we don't even understand within the country proper that there are so many different types of black cultures and black experiences that can exist in that one country as well. So, you know, what I try to do is to flush that out and to show that nuance because for most people it's it's not the way in which they're educated and oriented towards. So it's just similar to like in the United States, how you have black Southern culture can be very different than black folks who are raised in the North, for example, like there's regional differences and those differences and those um, different spices, I like to call them exist throughout every country in the region. And I think that's what makes it so powerful and so beautiful is that we have so many influences from other countries, from other parts of the Caribbean as well. And we have to acknowledge that in terms of how our culture has been shaped. First of all, I agree with everything that Jamila just said as a fellow Panamanian. Okay. Um, but one of the things that I think is interesting about my work in particular is that I am a curator for Latino studies at an African-American museum. So I work at the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. Yes. And when people introduced me, they tried to introduce me as a curator for Afro-Latino studies. And I'm quick to correct them and say, no, I'm a curator for Latino studies, for Latinx studies in an African-American museum. Because the ways in which Latinidad relates to African-Americanness is not only on a level of Blackness. You know, and so getting into all of these layers that Jamila was just talking about, and the way that we tend to homogenize Blackness when we talk about Blackness just as in and of itself. Right, so we start talking about a flat African-American history and culture as though there aren't different layers, as though there are not black immigrants to the United States over time that change what African-Americanness looks like. But also I think when, particularly for my museum that says that we tell American history through an African-American lens, that lens is not only seeing African-American people, right? So maybe people who maybe don't identify as Afro-Latinx in the US, their US experiences have been totally shaped by African-American history and culture. And their experiences in Latin America have been shaped by black people in that country, whatever sending country they're coming from. And so the way that I generally break down what I do is talking about my different areas of responsibility, which include diaspora, which include US-based Latinx identity. And again, when we talk about Latinx identity, in the United States, we consider that a U.S.-based identity, right? That people are not Latinx in Latin America. They're Brazilian or Antiano or Panamanian. However, when we talk about Afro-Latinidad, somehow Afro-Latinx becomes all Black people in the Americas. And so I try, at least in my work, to separate Afro-Latinx as a U.S.-based experience from Afro-Latin America. You know, again, bringing up these issues that national boundaries matter, that cultural boundaries matter, that how you are a black person as a lived experience in the United States is gonna be different from other countries. I think when we're able to tease that out, particularly you know, in museums where you get audiences from everywhere, it's important for them to start creating these distinctions and understanding that blackness is not the same everywhere. So for me doing Latino studies, it always includes black people. It doesn't only include black people. You know, doing African-American history and culture, it does include traditional African-American narratives, but it also includes all of these Black people in the United States who may or may not call themselves African-Americans, but certainly are living Black experiences in the United States. I'm so glad that Ariana brought in that distinction because that was like, you know, <laughs> that was like, a, you know, I, I was hoping that somebody would in terms of what it means to be la la from, from Latin origin here in the U.S. and um and being and living in Latin America, because some people, you know, are here, there are Latin that were born here, or they've been living here since they were three. Um, so they actually never had an experience in Latin America, but they are, of course, of Latin American heritage. That being said, you know, I work in a museum, I work in the Paris Art Museum in Miami, um, and I, and I, um, and it's, we don't have categories, you know, we do mostly contemporary art and modern art. And so there's no there's there's nobody dedicated to a specific like a specific region or a specific you know historical mo moment besides the one I just mentioned. So there aren't any categories, but we are very concerned about who our audiences are. And here in Miami, you know, we have a, a big Latin population or a population of Latin origin. A lot of it, which is actually uh, Cuban, 
which is actually changing as we speak. And you see it, you know, for example, football or soccer is played here a lot. And that's not a uh, Cuban, um, perhaps that's not something that was brought from Cuba, rather Central American countries and other parts of South America. So um, we're very conscious of who our audience is and, and we try to, to address that. And actually, I think that's one of the reasons why I was probably brought into the curatorial team there because as somebody that is black and that it's born in the Caribbean, um, I would add to diversifying uh, those spaces. So in that sense, I do see my work in the place that I'm working in now as a moment in which I can um, contribute from my perspective to the broader issues that are, um, that are being spoken to and addressed to in contemporary art and also in, in modern art. Yeah. And Maria Magda. I think that uh, both have been uh, very important and very present in my work. I tend to be uh, very careful about terms and about categories and about uh, how to define the practice and how uh, to, to take into account to the practice definitions in the field that maybe would be helpful and maybe would be very confusing or complex. Um, I, all, of, all of my work um, has been present. Issues of blackness and the experience of the black diaspora has been very present in my work. And issues of a Latino, Latino Americanidad, let's say, uh, separated as well. Uh, I born in Cuba after Castro Revolution. I, I participate in a generation of artists and thinkers uh, that come to age uh, in the 80s. And it was a very serious and profound discussion there about not only a, me a meaning of Latino America as geography and culture, but uh, as sentiment. Uh, historically uh, engaged with um, a political and geographical struggle from 19th century when the uh, Cuban revolutionary fighters in a uh, colonial Spain, uh, trying to, to bring together many parts of Latin America and the Caribbean in that fight uh, for freedom. So um, I am thinking as an artist, always the concept of um, blackness which was something that I only reflect upon after leaving Cuba. Meanwhile, I was living in Cuba, growing in Cuba, I always think about presence of issues or racism in some way or another, but uh, black, it was very present. Cuba is, by definition, a black country uh, presented in many ways by white faces. Every core of important element of Cuban culture, literary, is coming out of a black experience. Uh, so it was not a question about how blackness uh, was present in the work because I was a black artist really trying to task um, uh, and build language uh, in contemporary practice. So for me, and that, and that is when I'm thinking that it, sometimes it gets for me complicated and difficult to go to when we try to separate, separate, separate. And I know that the, the need for compartmentalization of the, of the categories to understand, uh, to create new language, to move forward is very important. At the same time, all my effort in my work is what I say, uh, showing the similarities to the differences. I, I believe that this is a programmatic, a philosophical, a fundamental scene in my work. I did a piece in 1993 or four that is called Mother Lamb Could Be a Trap, Identity Could Be a Tragedy. Neither I was negating the sense of belonging to a place, neither I was negating the necessity to explore who am I, where I come from, who were my ancestry. But I was literally confronting and commenting upon the limitations and the, and the traps in which one could get if we just narrow too close motherland, fatherland, and identity. So I am a Cuban uh, by birth, uh, living in many parts of the world, uh, from ancestry of many parts of the world, as I say, Chinese, uh, Spaniard, Afro uh, uh, African, 
and, and others that I still, <laughs> still to used to find and trying to make a mark and trying to uh, bring language that talk about all of those things together. Is that a definition of Afro-Latinidad? Is that an, a definition of Latinx? Um, I always saw, and I always have experience uh, with discomfort at some time, when I arrived to US, that I was not considered an Afro-American artist, that it was a different definition to be Afro-American and be Afro-Cuban. And I still have a huge uh, a, a set of questions unanswered after 32, 32 years living in the United States of that. Um, uh, what is it, just a question of what was born, which is very important, of, 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 of one, of one self had the opportunity to burn again in many places that we exist and we live in. I, when I was living in Italy, I was thinking about, you know, Latinidad, what does it mean being a woman uh, black from Cuba, working and living in a city in Italy, painting there, making art there. Uh, so I, I think that is a, 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 a very a compli a complex, I don't want to say complicated, complex and rich issue, and my work is filled with that. Uh, when I performed in the Guggenheim in 2016, what I did, what I did to just to bring is the small black body to the center of the architecture of Frank Law Wright. And creating this conversation, here you have a woman that could be uh, considered or is of Afro-Latino uh, origin uh, in conversation with this um, icon of white male dominant architecture, which is never questioned about the definition of who he is because it's granted. The definition of who am I is always into question. That bothers me. That really is something that I have been fighting against and, uh, and, and I know that it's a question of necessity. But I want to have the same uh, tabula rasa or in a way just being uh, without just need to be, you know. Uh, and I was going to, to this, and then I specifically talk about this a, a, a particular piece, Habla la Madre in Guggenheim, because I was thinking, oh, okay, here, the Latin American icon, the, the black woman, Yemaya, is in conversation with Fran Law Wright. He doesn't know his own conversation with Yemaya, but I know it. I'm going to bring it together. I'm going to, I'm going to talk in talk here. Uh, in some way, I feel privileged with more information. Yes. And I think, I think Maria Elena, you wanted to add something to that. Yeah, I wanted to react to two things that Magda was saying about categories and also about African-American history when you came into the U.S. for the first time. I think that, you know, race, as we know, is a construction of people of power to maintain power. Therefore, they're the ones creating the categories. And ultimately, we decide to use them or not as force of empowerment or whichever way we want to use them. I think that the beauty of um, like maybe Afro-Latinx or Afro-Latinidad or whatever we choose to call it is that it's such a layered category that it actually has the power to break them all. I, I believe, I strongly believe. So I think that um, in a way we still, of course, you know, use the categories but we can still get out of them if we choose to um or to the extent that we want to and also you know like i can sh i agree or i i can sh i share that experience of coming to the u.s and people telling me in different parts that i've been oh you're not black or you're not african-american um i mean and, and it goes from from personal like my 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 brother-in-law telling that to my sister and he's african-american telling that to us to completely strangers on the street and the more I think of that question, the more for me, it just means that I'm not part of black American history. And I actually think there's some truth to that. Like my experience of blackness in Puerto Rico was very different than somebody that, ex that, that lived in certain parts of the US. You know, my, 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 I don't share that certain historical references or certain historical moments. 
And, and that's where, um, to me, those type of comments about belonging to one's history lie on. You know, Maya and Lena, thank you for stirring that pot because that's something I definitely want us to return to a little bit later. But I do want to have a chance to hear from Luis and Thiago about how your experience of blackness and Latinidad that informs your work or, you know, if, if it does at all. So Luis, if you could talk a little bit, especially because you're both um, primarily based outside of the U.S. So that will expand the conversation we've had a little bit. Um, well, for me, how I only a few years uh, that I've started, uh, mostly my work before was about identity, but only a few years I've started tackling like head on. Uh, I, I like started looking into Afro Latinidad. And uh, it's mostly uh, from a pace of memory, like things that I remember in a childhood, you know, like looking at telenovelas and TV and representation and identity. And also about uh, things that I was taught in school, like, you know, how, how do they spoke about slavery in schools and, and what they taught me about the history of Venezuela and how, how much I remember about, uh, how much I remember about learning about slavery in school. And, um, uh, for example, uh, you know, I recently, uh, uh, through my research, I've been looking a lot uh, uh, to um, to Simon Bolivar and what was his relationship, uh, for example, in independence to slaves. Uh, so, you know, uh, everybody praises uh, the historical figure about Simon Bolivar, but then after Venezuela became free, slavery was still there. And uh, as uh, it was mentioned before, you know, Bolivar went to Haiti and then came back. And it was only then, like halfway into the fight for independence, that Bolivar kind of, well, so it said, uh, you know, you can read it in his letters, that it kind of like something like clicked on it, that it was not only about uh, the descendants of Europeans that were going to be free. Also, a lot of people were against uh, free slaves because who was going to, who was gonna work the fields after you know they had the country to themselves? So like uh, like like those things that I look into, like how much do we praise these people? And you know, you always hear things how Simon Bolivar he liberated seven nations and blah blah blah. But you know, there's always the other side of the of the coin that you have to look at as well. And uh, so like it, it comes from a place of memory and like visibility. And invisibility, uh, and how the word "negro" was used when I was growing up, uh, on, like until I was a teenager. Or, for example, when we migrated from Venezuela to Trinidad, what was the reasons why we came to Trinidad uh, against the reasons why we did not go to Chile? For example, uh, I remember I, I was like 18 years old around that time, and remember my parents having conversations about moving to Chile and and talk, discussing about amongst his, their Chilean friends that uh, that Chile would not be a good place for someone uh, on uh, like in my skin color. You know, I will have a very difficult time either going through education or finding a job or things like that. And that was one of the reasons why we moved to Trinidad uh, instead of Chile. And uh, and then, you know, I, I started looking things at like my name. My name is Luis Alberto Vasquez La Roche. My, my name is Spanish. My name has French in it. And the La Roche, for example, I recently found out through the slave registry. And, you know, and my work like takes on a lot of a lot of fictional stuff and magical realism. I found the the first La Roche in the slave registry in Trinidad. And, uh, and, you know, I've been trying ever since I've been trying to trace back if this person uh, is part of my lineage. Uh, so, it you know, the slave registry shows you when she was sold to Trinidad with a three-month-old uh, uh, son. And later on, other slave registries, like in the 1850s, uh, show other names of other La Roche. And, uh, and you know, how, how do I feel about those things? Uh, also the things about language, uh, the, uh, the word of the use negro and, uh, how is it, uh, in a positive or in a negative, uh, context? Yeah, go. what about you? 
I'm here. Uh, well, uh, sometimes I, sometimes I, I feel a little bit like I follow you, but I don't know exactly if what I'm trying to share, it's really graspable, if such a word exists. Uh, because I, I really feel that Brazil is it's really isolated in all these discussions. But well, concerning my work, it depends where I am, with whom I'm working to, and how I will allow or will try to present my experience as a black person in the work. No, so I, I couldn't properly say it's this way or it's that way. It's really depends about the circumstances. Of course, I am a black person. This always comes with me. Uh, but I'm also a cis man and I'm also a man with a non-normative sexuality. And so, uh, it really depends on like what kind of institution I'm working with. And I just always try to not be trapped by white directors in certain institutions who want to have a project with a young black creator, this kind of stuff. It seems for me that now in, in, in Brazil we have like this trend, you know, like there's all, all, all this discussion about like African Brazilian art, African Brazilian artists, African Brazilian curators. So what I'm trying to explore more and more in, in my work is to be a little bit more opaque in that context, you know? So my blackness and my experience there come with me, but I just simply don't want to give it so easily. Yes. Yeah. You have me thinking about um, Edward Plisson, talking about... Oh. oh, for sure, for sure. Like, he's kind of like, well, a hero and a reference in certain aspects. Yeah. Okay, so what potential do you think there is for this kind of um, diaspora and blackness or black internationalism, like I said, or what used to be called Pan-Africanism? This is Jamila. I'll start first. I think that actually I want to go back and stay on the question because, um, you know, we're talking about the distinction of black internationalism, I think is so important because you know, I really resonated with what Luis was talking about with Bolivar and how very much so throughout the region he's celebrated as a liberator, but it's like a liberator for whom? And that's why Black internationalism and having the Black in front of it is so important because what so happens so often throughout the world and of course through the Americas is that um, our Blackness, our culture, all of the things that about Negro being cool are commodified, but they don't respect us as people, our bodies, our humanity, any of those things. I mean, for me, having, I grew up in the United States, mostly. I grew up in Spain, which is a, a whole other conversation about being a Black Latin American in Spain. Um, and what I found out just through my travels, I lived in Guatemala, I've you know, lived in Honduras, I've been all through Latin America. And what I realized is that black culture is really the dominant culture in Latin America. In most countries that you go to, so much of our dance, our food, all of that comes from our Africanness. And that is the reason why I think it's so important for us to come together and to have these conversations and to celebrate our experiences, the complexities of what it means to be black, what it means to be black within our own context, within our own countries, and what are the things that unify our experience? Because the more that I travel through the world and the more that I seek out black communities everywhere I go, I find that we have these such strong similarities and it's so beautiful to see how our culture has been maintained in so many different ways. And I'm always fascinated by people's versions of different things. Like one fun example that I tell my friends is that I feel like every country in the Americas has their own version of twerking, right? Like when we talk about dance, I'm like, it's booty shaking, but there's like in you know Honduras, they're gonna call it punta, right? Like it's just fascinating to me how there's just core elements 
of all of that. And I think there's so much potential for us to build off of it. And there's so much political power in particular, you know, it's like, that's the thing is that we have been taught that we are so different for so long and that our histories are different. And that actually relates back to the experiences and having a black experience in Latin America may be different, but at the same time, you still had Arturo Schomburg, who's Afro-Puerto Rican, who's the father of black history in the United States. So there's just so much that we can be doing to work with each other and share with each other and building not only connections, but also political power and economic power. Tiago, you talked about not wanting to give away your blackness so easily. And I think that some of that is coming up in what Luis is saying as well. So how do we think about making these links across black people while at the same time exercising some opacity? How would that work for you, Jago? Mm -hmm. uh, well, because an ongoing exercise, uh, uh, I've been trying, you know, I've been trying, trying to, I've been trying to work with certain projects, certain people uh, that might help me. The, create a new grammar, you know, or new possibilities of coexisting together uh, and facing history in, well, basically, I want to achieve the, the freedom to do whatever I want to do, being a black creator, in a way, that, that's it. But I, I come from a very personal and, and, and specific context, maybe, you know, like, uh, it's really crazy how, like, white watching in Brazilian history, and so like, when when you when when uh, I, I have this platform that is called like we cannot think what we cannot build what we cannot first imagine, because I basically like I didn't know what a curator was seven years ago, eight years ago in a way, because I basically couldn't really understand exactly what were those white men doing in museums or in artistic institutions. You know, I, I, I couldn't properly see myself there. Uh, and so w when I say, when I tell you that I don't want to give it away my, my blackness so easily, it's basically that I don't want to, first, I don't want to teach anyone. Like, I don't want to educate white people because most of these people, powerful, powerful people in, in institutions, of art are white in, in this context of in the Brazilian context at, at least uh, and, and so as I, as, I, as I said like it's a very difficult complex as Maria said before uh, an ongoing project you know uh, I, I'm trying to find the tools I'm trying to connect with different collaborators and friends and colleagues in several areas of the world who are also thinking about blackness and who are also trying to explore possibilities of talking about blackness and of course my first step considering black solidarity or, or whatever name we, we might want to give to it uh, is learn about different contexts beyond mine own and different experience of blackness beyond mine because this might uh, give me some support and help to achieve what I'm looking for. Ariana, I want to come back to you because I think in your role at the National Museum of African American History, these kinds of questions must come up. Yeah, I mean, most times I get why is there a curatorial position for Latino studies in an African American museum? But when you think about, you know, as, as we've all been alluding to, the transatlantic slave trade, the fact that no one is well educated about it, you know, no matter what national context you're talking about. When you go into the museum or even just talking about Afro-Latinidad as definition and living that experience in the United States, it is new information for so many people that the forced migration of Africans was not just to the United States. You know, there's a map that shows everywhere from West Africa to the Americas where enslaved populations went. And that is new information to so many people in 2018. You know, so thinking about why we talk about the African diaspora not just as a transatlantic slave trade, but the makings of the modern world. And I think when we start there and then we start talking about black agency and black connectedness and white supremacy and legacies of colonialism, we recognize 
how connected our experiences are regardless of national borders, right? And so I do think that there is a growing consciousness globally. I think using terminologies like Afro-Latino, Afro-Latinidad, Afro-Cuban, Afro-Panamanian, and those, that Afro really only goes to countries where people don't necessarily associate Black people, right? I've never heard anyone say Afro-Haitian or Afro-Jamaican, right? Because we associate those countries with Blackness in a way that for a lot of people, they just do not in certain parts of Latin America. So I think as we continue to articulate our own identities in this way, as individuals, as communities, as networks, we really start to see a larger, what would be a more modern interpretation of Pan-Africanism. I do think that the, that the growing consciousness is there. And I know Tiago was talking a little bit about Brazil feeling isolated. Sometimes I think the United States and African-Americans feel isolated from Pan-African conversations around the Americas. You know, that our own, I know this gets into another question, um, but our own U.S. hegemony sometimes divorces us from the rest of the diaspora in a way that we really should be coming together. I would say that we have a very dubious relationship with the U.S., you know? Like, uh, I learned English watching USA movies or learning or watching and listening to USA songs, most of them were performed by black artists uh, who I somehow was looking up to. But at the same time, sometimes I do feel that, like, I, well, I don't know, it's just like the USA were somehow, they were the responsibles or they were the ones who created the idea of blackness. So it's quite crazy. But of course, this is also certain issues that I have coming from Brazil and are coming from South America and how a person who comes from South America might relate to the U.S. itself, you know, and not only uh, to the black population, but what the U.S. means to us. You know, like in Portuguese, we don't even say Americans. We say Estadunidense. That is an, it's a kind of like a, a word that means a USA citizen concerning that all of us are Americans. Uh, considering, uh, so it, it, I I think it's a it's a very difficult position that we are. You know, like we of course they have the power due to the influence of the country and due, of course, to the way black people who were born in the U.S. manage to struggle to fight for certain rights. They are for sure a reference, and they are uh, people that I'm looking up to. But at the same time, that's not what I want to do. That's not my reality, and that's not how usually I perceive the world. What Lisa was saying about like, oh, there, there's so much history to be told. And of course, those histories are not going to be, be told unless we go out there and find them and tell them ourselves. Um, I've been doing a lot of research on my own family, right? Like ancestry and all that crap. Um, and like, it's very interesting how once Puerto Rico became a U.S. territory or U.S. colony, ideas of race changed the island. And all this to say that I think that the U.S. does, the same way that it exports culture like Beyonce and so on to other places, it also exports ideas of race. And, um, for example, my, um, my great-grandfather, on the 20, in the 1910 census, he qualified himself as mulatto. And in the, te in the 1920 census, he qualified himself as white. And in the last 120 years the U.S. have been in Puerto Rico, the, the population has whitened itself. So in the last census of 2010, 75% of the population qualified themselves as white. So I do think that like how we are, how, how race is experienced in other parts of the world, specifically the closest you are geographically to Latin America, at times is affected by the way the U.S. is exporting ideas of race and who and the images of who has power in in the images that they're exporting totally agree with that i mean what i can say from the panamanian experience with the united states controlling the canal the united states actually implemented jim crow in the panama canal zone which is something that most people don't know so they brought segregation to the country and my own family was touched by this when my grandfather who worked in the canal zone 
um, he worked at the post office and he spoke out against a white U.S. officer and was sent to cut grass for six months. And for those who don't know, in Panama is elephant grass. So the grass is very tall, like usually about eight feet tall and extremely thick. So it can be upwards of five inches wide. So you can only cut it by hand with a machete. So he was sent to do that work for six months. The other thing I want to say is, you know, I, I, this issue of ownership is really important to me. And it's important to me because when we talk about Afro Latina, we get so stuck in the identity, we don't realize that we don't have kind of ownership over that identity. And a lot of what Tiago was saying also resonated for me. And I say this because a lot of the reason that people in the Caribbean, people all over the world understand Black people in Latin America from a U.S. context is because even Latin American programming like Univision in Telemundo are shot in the United States. So the pervasiveness of U.S. imperialism is on a different scale than I think we even kind of understand and talk about it. And a lot of what I work on with people in the United States, particularly even Black Americans, is to talk about their role, their privilege, our role, our privilege. I include myself in that as somebody who has been raised and educated primarily in the United States, and that we have to understand that it is that Black American culture that unfortunately um, predominates conversations about what it means to be Black all over the world. And in order for Black internationalism to really have a, a chance of moving forward and advancing, Black people who were born and raised in Western countries of privilege need to step back and need to make sure that we're centering folks from the global South, that we are allowing for all of the different variations, beauty and complexities of what it means to be Black to happen. And we also have to interrogate you know, those stories coming out from Latin America who are telling those stories. It's mostly white mestizo people. And there's also these folks who are coming from these Western countries. It's coming from Spain and it's coming from the United States. And that's something that I think in terms of media consumption and the power of media and what that means is something that we have to very much so interrogate. I just want to say that I know that we are talking about the United States, but we cannot let Latin American governments off the hook for their racism, for their anti-Blackness, for those legacies of colonialism, you know, for de facto segregation that happened all over Latin America. So absolutely, the United States had a role in that, but they are certainly not the only ones. I want to talk about something that's structuring this whole conversation, and that is language. So I want to hear from everyone. Do you think that there are implications to having this conversation in English? And I ask this because I am personally interested in translation and multilingualism, but also because I'm thinking about language and power and the historic relationship between the English-speaking USA and the largely Spanish and Portuguese-speaking Caribbean, Central, and South America. So as an English speaker and coming from Jamaica, we've invited you to talk about this in English, um, I think as a gesture towards thinking about that Black internationalism and working across boundaries. But language is also, I think, an important boundary that plays into this. So whether in this conversation or in general, what do you think about that? We're probably right now speaking in English because probably that's the language that we all have most in common. Um, if we all had the, the Spanish in common, I'll be happy speaking that language. For me, I think that um, a few things. First one is that um, most of the scholarship in terms about race that I've come across with has been in English. And I think there's a dire need to create more of the scholarship in Spanish which is pointing to the histories that, that need to be told in those contexts. So I think that um, for me, if information is in as many languages as possible, the best. Now, in terms of actually having that conversation, like in the context that we're right now or in a um, presentation setting, I've been to presentations um, or convenings in the Caribbean where things are in English, French, Spanish, all at the same time. And you can imagine that if we were translating this conversation in real time, it would be like a day old, you know, like it will be, it, would, it takes so long. So I think that, so there's, there's, there's always this wrestling between being practical and also being inclusive. 
And unfortunately, inclusive with language, and unfortunately in my museum, like I think what happens a lot is that we, we when you start adding languages, the question of the language that's not, that is not there becomes even more um, loud. So, um, you know, we get asked often, like in, in, the, in the museum, oh, you don't have um, uh, Creole, like Haitian Creole, or you don't have um, Portuguese. And we have a very practical answer for that, which is like most of the, the households in Miami speak Spanish at home, like 60%. So it's a, uh, and then we actually did try using um, Creole, um, like family guys and other materials and people wouldn't pick them up. Um, and, you know, that could even go to the question of for who the museum is for and who are the demographics that actually visit the museum space. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a very complex question, but I don't particularly, you know, what I want personally is to create, or, or there'll be more available scholarship on this topic in the most language possible. And I do think that we do need more of this certainly from, uh, Spanish, you know, from the Latin perspective or, or so on, because that's missing significantly in contrast with, with English and studies in the U S or even in the French Caribbean, you know, the French Caribbean has a great tradition of um, speaking about identity and race within their own terms. I definitely agree that it's complex. I think that for purposes of us having conversations like this, um, definitely speaking in languages that are predominant is important. But one thing I do want to stress is that not everyone in Latin America only speaks either Spanish, Portuguese, or even Creole, but there are others who speak Garifuna, Palenquero, and I wanna make sure that we create space for that. I think a lot of people kind of think of the region and think of the two predominant languages, but may not realize that there are so many Afro-descendants that have their own kind of proper language. Creole is the main one that people might be most familiar with. So um, I think that there's a conversation that when we're having the discussions in our community, we have a responsibility to be in conversation with folks in the language that they are most comfortable with so that we can get the most out of it. And I agree as well that there's so much we can learn from folks in the French speaking Caribbean and in other parts of the world and other regions where they're having that conversation in their particular language and ways in which we can make those bridges is important. The other thing I will say quickly is in talking about gender, we also need to realize that there are people who do not fit into a gender binary and understanding that Spanish and Portuguese can be very limiting for those folks. So that's part of the reason that Afro Latinx came about is to be inclusive of people who are trans and gender non-binary. So I just want to add um, from the point of view of the visual language, uh, I, I would not try to get into the language just because it's not my, my territory specifically. But I wanted to comment almost back to a, a, a mention from Ariana about um, the presentation of work, of topical work and in timely moment as such uh, the conversation about the transatlantic journey being discussed in 2018 uh, almost for the first time in the in the national museum but i would say that no that there are many artists that have been working in those teams for many many years uh, and those work maybe have not been presented not being visible because they it's the sort of inequality on representation and selection of work for museums so uh, as in the panel are a few curators, uh, my call will be about the effort for creating agency and vehicles in which work being done by Afro-Latin American, Afro-Cubans, Afro-Latins in general, artists finding uh, the spaces of representation with adequacy. So the topics that have been fundamental to this discussion could be seen from the light of those perspectives uh, not for now, but for a long, long time before. And the last thing that I want to add, first of all, thank you for inviting me to the conversation, and invite you all uh, to Matanzas, uh, the center of Afro-Cuban life in Cuba, in which in 2019, uh, this city will be hosting an event 
as the second venue for the Havana Biennale. And every one of the topics that we discuss in today uh, could be brought to a platform in that context. And I am uh, extending an invitation to you all to reconvene in Matanzas in April of 2019 uh, with an agenda and keep discussing. I could just say one quick thing is I didn't mean to imply that the museum is talking about the transatlantic slave trade for the first time. I mean, just with the volume of visitors in the United States, people often think about enslavement only as a U.S. experience. So it's the first time a lot of people are recognizing the magnitude of the impact of the transatlantic slave trade on the Americas outside of the U.S. Not that it's the first time that that, that information had been presented. Um, but in terms of language, I mean, for myself, I grew up in a monolingual household. You know, no one spoke Spanish to me when I was growing up. So I learned Spanish later in life. So for me, it's comfortable. Um, I do speak Spanish when I need to, particularly if I know that there are issues um, of communication or understanding. But really just to echo everything that everyone else has said, I think it's so important that we continue to say out loud that Spanish and Portuguese and English are not the only languages of the Americas. And so although the exhibitions that I curate are always in English and Spanish, it's always important in public programming or in literature to remind people that these are not the only languages spoken. And I think the more we can continue just to say that out loud, to, you know, so that stays in people's consciousness you know, to this issue that you're talking about, about language and about power. I always like to end um, by asking presenters, what, what are you working on now or what is really exciting for you? so that our listeners can follow you. So let's just wrap up with that. Um, Tiago? Nicole, thank you for the invitation, first of all. And uh, thank you all for this discussion. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you, Jamila. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Malian. Thank you, Maria. Uh, it was like super special and important for me. Uh, now I'm living in Berlin. And I am a member of the 10th Berlin Biennale Curatorial Team. So I'm working with Nomaduma Masilea, Yvette Mutumba, Moses Serubiri, and Gab Nobo for the 10th edition. That is, is uh, it's opening on June the 9th and goes until September. I hope if you are around, you can join. It will be a pleasure. Uh, and then later, life goes. Uh, Luis, what about you? What are you working on? I'm doing my master's degree uh, in VCU. So um, that's what I might be for the next two years. Maria Magda, you told us a little bit about yours already, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am just a move to Nashville, but I have been um, appointed as a endowed chair professor of art at Vanderbilt University. So that is a new situation. I am working in a new solo show for the National Museum of Fine Art in Cuba for 2019. And I am working for the project that you invited you before in Matanzas, which will be the second set for Havana Biennale. And it would be fantastic if we could all get in person together in a, in a conversation there. And <laughs> Maria Elena, what are you up to? Um, well, I'm actually, I'm opening a show at the museum on Thursday by an artisan, William Cordova, and, um, which I think that, you know, it's interesting, he's Peruvian, and although he doesn't physically look black, he calls himself Afro-Peruvian, so I think that, um, just to think about how identity and the U.S., because most of his lives have been in the U.S., um, is what kind of resonates with some of those questions, or even poses more questions about the complexity of identity, um, between the U.S. and Latin America. Then I'm also working on another project <laughs> by the end of the year by a Latin American artist, um, 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 Jose Carlos Martinat, who's Peruvian. And then I'm also working, you know, I feel like in at, at PAM, um, we need like more discussions on Latinx because we dwell out of Latin American. So I partnered with some other colleagues to do up program, a public program on Latinx, uh, like questioning ideas of, of, similar to what we talked, but on a public setting, and that's going to be in January, <laughs> and then I'm working on another um, show for the fall of 2019, which is actually uh, based on the Caribbean, and I'm also giving birth in July. Oh, congratulations. Oh. 
Thank you. So I wanted to go to the Berlin Biennale, but I don't think I can make it. <laughs> oh, Ariana, yes, you could. Ariana, I have some smaller projects, a lot of speaking, <laughs> a lot of conference presentations. Um, but I think the main thing that I'm doing is the foundational work that I'm considering legacy building. I mean, we're so young as a museum, we're like a year and a half open to the public. <laughs> so we're really dedicated to have this culturally responsive and culturally responsible collections database. So I'm largely reviewing our current collections um, to make sure that the objects and the stories that are Latinx and Latin American related are cataloged that way. Right, not just for our own knowledge and research, but so that when people are searching our collection, they actually understand what Latinx studies through an African American lens actually looks like and how we operationalize that at our museum. And of course, collecting. So if anyone has anything for me around diaspora, Afro Latinidad, Afro Latinx, Latinx, African American relationships with Latinx communities, and African Americanness in Latin America, let me know. I will be speaking at the Afro-Latino Festival in New York City on July 14th at the Ebron Center in the Lower East Side. So I would invite you all to come to New York City that weekend and experience our Afro-Latinx family reunion, as we like to call it. <laughs> um, other things I'm working on, I unfortunately can't really talk about yet, but they uh, definitely involve Puerto Rico and really shining a light on black communities there like Loisa and Carolina after the hurricane. Um, but you can definitely keep in touch with what I'm doing and hopefully I'll be able to share more on Twitter. I'm always on Twitter, as many people know, like Ariana. <laughs> and my Twitter handle is at msjamila, J-A-M-I-L-A-A-I-S-H-A. -A -A. So Miss Jamila Aisha on Twitter. Please check me out. Thank you so much, guys, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so Nicole. much. Gracias. Gracias. Obrigado. So we can call <laughs> Gracias.